righty. Looks like we're live. So cool. Uh, thanks for coming back. And let me apologize once again for last Tuesday when we ran into some insurmountable uh, kind of technical challenges for ourselves in this office anyways. So yeah, episode five of uh, <laughs> Barry Blanchard's greatest Alpine first ascents in the Canadian Rockies, 1983 to 2002. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, a route on Mount Saskatchewan called the Silver Lining and uh, uh, another route on Howe's Peak. I say another because I previously talked about the north face of Howe's Peak in 1988, but this will be uh, a route called M16 on the east face of Howe's Peak in 1999. So, bring up my share screen here, and uh, looks like we're doing that. I'll just make this a little bigger over here, and uh, see if I can go back one claim here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the uh, stories of these first ascents actually start back in 1989 with my first attempt to put a route up on the emperor face of Mount Robson in winter conditions. Uh, a project that uh, um, was started in 89, then I got back to it in 1997. And uh, this is a picture of my two partners in 1997. So between 89 and 97, the first generation of alpinists that I climbed with, a lot of them moved on to family and career and left alpinism. And I started climbing uh, with the next generation of, of alpinists in North America, which was pretty darn cool. And in 89, my partners on uh, the Emperor face were uh, Ward Robinson and Jim Elzinga. And uh, yeah, so 97, um, it was the first time I got to climb with the guy in red here, Steve House. So probably the best uh, alpinist ever come out of North America, although we're producing some really strong alpinists these days. And then also uh, Joe Josephson, uh, originally from Montana. Steve's originally from uh, Oregon. And uh, yeah, yeah, these are my two partners. And actually, this was in 1997 on that second attempt on the Emperor face of Mount Robson. This is actually a picture from the Emperor face of Mount Robson. But the next year, 1998, Jojo and Steve and I convened again in the Mount Robson parking lot below the magnificent 3,000 meter west face of Mount Robson, which is uh, just an amazing thing to behold. And hopefully if you ever drive through that part of the world that you actually get to see that face because not everybody gets to see it driving through there. It creates a lot of its own weather. <clears throat> so. And it was doing it in 1998. We got to the parking lot. I was paying $3.50 a minute to talk to an Environment Canada forecaster in live time, like over the phone. And, you know, I said, we're on Mount Robson. We want to go climbing. Can you give us a forecast? He was super interested. So, yeah, I kept the meter running. Didn't give us a break, I don't think. But, uh, yeah, he told us we had one day of good weather and then uh, a front was coming through and it was going to, you know, there's going to be a storm. So not enough time for the emperor face of Mount Robson. So I uh, suggested to Steve and Jojo who were crowded right around me with the payphone, and uh, we were all listening to this environmentalist. And, you know, we hang up and it's like, oh man, bummer. I said, well, I spotted this line on the north wall of Mount Saskatchewan back at the Columbia Ice Fields. It's got to get climbed. We should go climb it. So we hopped in my truck, Steve hopped in his car, we backtrack uh, to the Columbia Ice Fields. And um, yeah, the Big Bend, which uh, is where a 1930s uh, work relief project. They started the Banff Jasper Highway, a crew in Jasper, crew down in Lake Louise, and they met right here at the Big Bend, just in time to go off to the Second World War. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> There's the Big Bend. So we slept in the parking lot here. And then the next morning, we got up uh, very, very early by headlamp and skied up towards the Saskatchewan Glacier. And the route that we climbed is actually on this aspect here. 
So about a 2,500 foot chunk of relief between the valley floor and the top of the wall here. And I guess actually looking at it, it's probably actually on Big Bend Peak because this is Big, Big Bend Peak here, but Big Bend Peak is actually part of the Mount Saskatchewan complex. So the summit of Mount Saskatchewan is way the heck over here, but all of this stuff around here is kind of part of that complex mountain and even more that we can't see out of the frame. So yeah, yeah, off we went and uh, arrived um, at uh, uh, the base of the route still in the dark. And uh, pretty darn impressive to, to see uh, Steve House uh, start to do his magic. And uh, the issue we had was the ice was above this rock roof. It didn't come all the way down to the snow. So there's about, uh, I guess, 20 feet of, of rock to get up before you can start to get to these baubles of ice. And then a very narrow plank of ice that's kind of tacked to this uh, vertical, less than vertical wall. But uh, yeah, we need to get up to the ice. And uh, yeah, Steve's starting in the dark. So dry tooling, his ice axe is on the rock, getting his feet established on the rock and traversing across to these ice baubles and then going up. And uh, yeah, I'd uh, put it actually in a good anchor, a proper anchor, good two piton anchor, and uh, felt good about that because uh, somewhere around here, Steve actually fell off. <laughs> he blew a, you know, a placement scratched off or something and suddenly he's windmilling back through the air and his ice axes are, you know, just <laughs> ratcheting around his wrists and whoop, he hammers down into the snow, probably fell, I don't know, 10, 15 feet through the air. And the snow at the base acted like a, a bouldering pad. It absorbed all the energy of the fall and he kind of sunk himself to knee deep in this snow, didn't hurt himself and didn't even weight the rope. And I was ready to hold because there's a 500 foot snow slope to go whistling down and hammer into a moraine at the bottom, none of which would feel very good. And uh, man, that young guy, 25 years old at the time, just wrenched his uh, feet out of that snow and went back up and started again and got over to the ice blobs this time, got in some marginal ice screws and went quite a ways before getting any real protection. So a pretty uh, risky lead and done just as, uh, you know, the sun was coming up and uh, kind of got us to the route. So this is a later picture of the route. Um, goes up here into this very obvious um, uh, fault in the mountain here. And similar to when we did the first ascent, you can see the ice doesn't come all the way down. This was on a guided attempt with uh, one of my clients and a, and a fellow guide actually. And this is somewhat similar to when we were there in 97, 98, sorry, we there in 98, except the ice was thinner here, it was that plank. So this is kind of healthy and in, in, in subsequent ascents of this route, and this route has probably had a half a dozen, maybe it's a half a dozen ascents that I know of that might be double the case, might be maybe a dozen ascents, but sometimes this ice has come all the way down to the snow as it is this year. So if you're interested in this route, go get it now because the, the ice is coming down to the snow. So you don't have to dry tool across this edge of this overhang and potentially fall back down into the snow and you can just get on the route. So yeah, and also other parties, um, Ian Wellstead and uh, Dana uh, uh, from, from Jasper, Dana Ruddy, they got onto the ice from this side. So there's a couple different options there. Um, when we were there, we got up into here and then this ice, similar to this picture, didn't touch down here. So we had to go out through here and then come back uh, onto the ice here into this chimney that you can't see. And uh, yeah, in the fat years like now, I think it's all just one ice strip. So there you go. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we, uh, Steve got up and I remember Jojo and I um, climbing up and uh, yeah, I, 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 can't, I think we climbed. I have to look in my own writing to, to see if we Jumard or not. I don't think we Jumard, I think we climbed.
And I uh, remember taking my ice axe, the broad side of my ice axe towards the top of this plank of ice that's detached and you feel it vibrate all the way up it, right? And I took the side of my ax and smacked this plank of ice and it fractured like a mirror. And it didn't fall away, but like these, this jigsaw, not a jigsaw, but linear fractures, like a mirror shattering. And then whatever light is being reflected at dawn, they're kind of uh, related, but disjoint. Uh, quite a striking image. And one that I obviously still carry with me to today. And uh, yeah, above that, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we're up here. I did a pitch and got us into a cave of, you know, a perfect bivy spot, just a perfect room. You could lay down in this place. Why can't we find these when we need them at the end of a long day? <laughs> but a perfect bivy site and uh, roof over our heads, flat, good anchors. So do what I like to do, which is eat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, Steve, pretty happy that uh, we're on the route and uh, we're heading up and uh, Jojo climbing out towards the dawn. And the dawn, um, you can see Mount Athabasca back here, a, a peak that many mountaineers in the Rockies will have climbed, our most famous and commonly ascended glaciated peak. And uh, yeah, it's cool, the dawn. Dawn is a miracle, especially in the mountains and doubly especially if you've traveled through the night and there's magic in traveling through the night. But um, Steve and I long ago agreed um, that as did my previous partners and I agree that we don't make decisions at dawn, just before dawn. There's some weak point in the human psyche where there's intimidation and lack of confidence I think it just coincides with when our eyes shut from go change from night vision to day vision. There's a period that we intentionally don't make decisions then. We don't make decisions right at dawn. So, yeah, and then the dawn comes on and, uh, you know, it's cold and all that kind of stuff. So to see the sun, you know, bring the earth back to life is pretty cool. And even feel some of that, uh, you know, it's going to start to heat up the air. This is April, so we're going to get some of that that uh, that warming happening for us. And Jojo going out, getting us back to the ice, doing a great lead, some 5'9 dry tooling. I don't know what that is on the M grade, probably about M4 or something like that. And uh, good gear, great climbing, taking us back to this uh, steeper chimney. And I think Steve, uh, on, on another great bivy location, heading out into the ice again, and into this chimney, it was one of the greatest ice pitches I'd ever climbed at that point in time. Like a chimney with ice in the back and on both uh, walls, these goblets and blobs and fish bowls of ice looked like beautifully blown gl glass. And you didn't really even have to, you know, smack your ice axe into it aggressively a lot. Maybe you put one in the back so you're, you know, feel very secure hanging onto an ax and with a wrist loop, we wore wrist loops back then. But then you could just palm off these ice holds and step your crampon points delicately onto these features of ice. And uh, yeah, yeah, magical climbing, leading us um, into kind of the more proper, um, you know, straighter forward ice climbing, but pretty cool place to be inside Mount, uh, uh, Big Bend or Saskatchewan, wherever it is, quite a large cornice up here. It's always, you know, spooky to have a cornice overhead, but I think that this cornice were it to break, it goes right to the root. And I like to convince myself of that because you can see you're kind of exposed in these features. If a cornice does break, man, it's going to come charging through here pretty darn fast and with a lot of uh, energy and uh, could cause you harm for sure. And uh, yeah, so we choose our belay positions on the sides under whatever kind of protection we can get from what the, the mountain might want to throw at us. So well into our day, this is probably, oh, maybe two thirds of the way up the route. And, uh, you know, a fair amount of snow climbing, uh, pretty straightforward snow climbing, maybe some ice bulges. And then we find another bivy <laughs> room, three bivy rooms on a one day route. Where's the irony in that? Another perfect place to bivouac. But uh, 
yeah, a uh, intimidating thing to look at and think we got to climb out there and it's my lead. So I got to suck it up here and go out and try to find passage out around this roof. And thankfully some good gear and that just kept working out, you know, edges to put my cramp on points on. I had my ice axe in a crack above the roof, my gloved hand on a handhold and it just kept working out and uh, got us above this. And uh, then uh, Steve uh, did some more of his magic and uh, I lifted this shot off the uh, Facebook actually, it's a Chris Irwin shot. So Chris, uh, thanks for the shot. And I just don't have a shot of this. It was later in the day. And were we to bivouac on this route, which we thought we might have to, we wouldn't have any gear. So we're going to have a cold night. Um, but, you know, we get up here and there's this really intimidating overhanging off width. And that is waiting to be climbed. So if anyone wants to straighten out the silver lining and make it a an even more spectacular challenging route there that's waiting for you and I think you can see if you look hard there's uh, Chris's partner coming across the exit ledges that we utilized also and got us out um, and uh, kind of onto the top of this wall and that was our route the silver lining and uh, yeah yeah um, pretty cool um, that, uh, you know, it's getting now into dusk and uh, there's Mount Athabasca and uh, Steve came up. We're both pretty happy. So is Jojo. Jojo took the picture and uh, yeah, uh, Steve goes, man, the silver lining. And I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, oh, not getting to go to, to, to the emperor on Mount Robson was our cloud, but this is our silver lining. And Jojo and I both go, wow, that is a great root name. That's it. It's called the silver lining. And uh, yeah, yeah, great day. And uh, yeah, the route here and that picture was somewhere up there. And one of the things uh, subsequent parties should do, and there's our escape ledges out here. Yeah, right here. And then we scrambled up there. It's a large uh, unsupported, uh, you know, avalanche prone slope up here. And we wanted to get off. So I actually was in front and I started out across this thing and I got into it and it was kind of too late to turn around. And I just like, what am I doing? You know, there is an absolutely fatal fall if this uh, slope decides to give us a slab avalanche. And why didn't we go straight up and, and go over the top where the, this didn't exist, but we get to the other side and, uh, you know, I go across first and I shout for Steve to come across, then Joe to, Joe, Joe to come across. And they get over there and I said, man, that was stupid. And they said, yeah, yeah, it'd be better to top out this way. But you can just walk down here, this drainage. We walked all the way back down to our skis, got on our skis, got back to my truck 20 hours after leaving it. <laughs> We have a, a comment from Jojo. <laughs> this is good. Jojo's watching in Montana. Hey, Jojo, brother, love you, man. <laughs> you butthead, anyone can climb it in these conditions. <laughs> uh, Rich Bennett, never heard Barry refer to Steve as farm boy. So... Yeah, yeah, some more about the origin of that name in the next uh, adventure here in this slideshow. So I'll leave that explanation uh, to here. And once again, next year, 1999, uh, kind of auspicious in a couple uh, different considerations. One consideration is that um, it's late March and uh, um, Jojo, <laughs> has gone off to, to be successful as a Patagonia field rep. And uh, he's got serious about career, so he can't go to the Emperor face with us or try to go to the Emperor face for round number three or four now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Scott Backies can. So it's uh, Steve uh, and uh, Scott Backies and I who don't get the weather forecast. So we don't even drive up to Rob's and we just, we didn't have the snow conditions. That was it. It was, uh, um, just a year we thought, uh, no, that was 2000. We didn't get the weather forecast. That's why we didn't go to Robson this year. We had enough time 
uh, we thought to go back and uh, try uh, uh, this ice line on the east face of Howes Peak. And these ice lines, people have known about these ice lines for as long as ice climbers have climbed ice. And uh, yeah, everyone's always looked to the east face of Howes Peak. So finally, we kind of get it together that we can go make an attempt there. The other auspicious part about this, uh, uh, this attempt is that um, at the end of our four days or three days of climbing that we plan, uh, my wife at the time had organized a large 40th birthday party for me. I'm going to turn 40 on March 29th of 1999, which means I'm turning 62 here pretty quick. But uh, yeah, you know, a lot of the, the best mountain climbers in North America are going to be at the Drake Pub on this night of my birthday. So pretty important we get back in time for my birthday, which we've got enough time that, yeah, yeah, I think we can, we can manage that. So a lot of personal history in this picture too. Um, the wild thing over here that I talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, and actually Jojo who's listening is well aware that he did the second ascent of the wild thing and they didn't have as much ice in the exit chimneys as uh, uh, Warden Peter Arbick and I were fortunate enough to have. But also stepping back in time, 1982 with Tim Friesen climbing this ridge um, one of the first big alpine routes done in the Canadian Rockies in the 60s. And uh, Don Vokaroth and Chick Scott and I think Charlie Locke. And I should check that because I might have that wrong. But uh, yeah, Tim Friesen and I climbed that in 1982. Took four days. Thought we'd only going to take two. Took four. <laughs> and then a couple episodes again, I talked about uh, uh, Ward Robinson and I doing the first ascent of the north face of Howe's Peak here. So yeah, yeah, that was 1988. So a lot of personal history on these two walls. A lot of my life and my best alpinism in the Rockies um, on those walls. And uh, yeah, so there's the line that we think we're gonna climb. And uh, recently kind of uh, coined the King Line. And uh, yeah, to quote another buddy, uh, Mark Twight, uh, who is quoting a punk band, actually. This is what you want. This is what you get. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Our uh, ambitions don't always uh, coincide with our uh, reality. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Steve House, uh, partner again, and uh, getting towards the, you know, just at the beginning of the very peak of his ability and uh, often said that if Ethan Hawke ever needed a uh, climbing double for a Hollywood movie, that Steve would be the man. And the story of uh, Farm Boy. So um, Scott Backies, and this is a great picture of Scott that I lifted off of Mark's webpage, actually, Mark Twight's webpage, and kind of uh, good indicative pictures of a lot of the kind of the personality, both really intense, intense personalities. But Steve, you know, has often had some color and light, a lot of darkness too. And Scotty has had no shortage of darkness in his life. So yeah, I like the fact that these pictures reflect that. But Scott, who was just over 40 at the time and of my generation, guy I've known for a long time, and actually never got to climb with outside of working at ice festivals before this. Um, yeah, yeah, Scotty had uh, uh, saddled uh, Steve, this 25 year old with the moniker of the great white hope of American alpinism. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, we uh, soon kind of shortened that to various derivatives like, uh, you know, whitey or <laughs> shorty or stuff like that. But uh, yeah, my wife at the time, um, said, no, nah, he's not so much the great white hope of American al alpinism as he is just a simple farm boy, which is from the Princess Bride. So we started calling call him farm boy. And uh, yeah, that's the, <laughs> the nickname that uh, seems to have stuck in my world um, is uh, Steve the farm boy, just a simple farm boy. And uh, yeah, yeah, so um, towards the end of March, I think it was March 23rd, we left Canmore very, very early in the morning Steve and Scotty and I heading off thinking we're going to get on the King Line. 
And uh, yeah, um, skiing across, uh, this would be, this is one of the waterfowl lakes. And I think uh, then you connect up with Mistea Lake or uh, the Kefren Lake, Lake Kefren below Mount Kefren, makes sense. You can see Steve has a second set of skis on his pack. Those are very specialized short uh, fern skis that I bought in Chamonix in 1991 as an approach ski. Had the lightest Petzl binding probably ever made for a, for a boot. Just basically clothes hanger and plastic with a cam on the back. So super light, designed for skiing on glaciers in the summertime. But what we're going to use them for in this ascent is we're going to get up to Kefren Lake, where if we come down the descent that Ward Robinson and I used in 1988 would be to get up, come across to the White Pyramid, which we can't see behind the Black Pyramid, traverse to the call between the Black Pyramid or Kefren and the White Pyramid, and come down these monstrous slopes, this ridgeline down to Kefren Lake. So if we have another set of sk skis there, we can leave our, our the skis on our feet up here under the wall and one of us can jump on the fern skis, go retrieve the three sets of skis and come back down as the other guys sit there and just generally have a good time. <laughs> so yeah, that's the idea with the second set of skis. And uh, they're left behind now and we're actually already started up into it. We've had to ski up some moraines and very soon here have to start crossing avalanche prone slopes and making decisions about the snow stability while we're still on skis. So we're actually not even in, you know, climbing terrain yet, but snow, you know, often the hardest one to try to figure out. Rock is so understandable compared to snow and it is so easy to make safe. Um, bad rock is bad rock. That's very complicated. And there's a lot of bad rock in the Rockies, but when you have good rock, it's so easy to know when your equipment is good. Um, ice is kind of the halfway medium for me. Um, when ice is good, ice screws are very dependable. It takes a long time to be able to judge when ice screws are actually good. So it's the halfway and then snow. Man, snow is just the hardest thing to figure out in my world and the hardest thing to anchor in. Um, yeah, hardest thing to make safe with, with equipment. So yeah, yeah, we have to start playing that, trying to outguess the, the snow game. And uh, yeah, I'm down at the bottom. We've put the three sets of skis in a teepee um, construction and lashed their tail, their tips together, outer range of the avalanches that come off of this wall. And <coughs> it'd just be such a drag to lose your skis to an avalanche. Come down and you got the post hole for uh, half a day to get back to the highway. So yeah, you need flotation. You need snowshoes or skis or something. Skis are a lot more fun. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as we're approaching, Scotty said to me, man, look at all the snow mushrooms this year. That This many usually, Bubba, that's my nickname. I said, no, we've had a lot of western wind, west, wind out of the west and snow this year. These are a lot more snow mushrooms than I'm used to seeing in the Rockies. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's the boys heading up. And so interesting to be um, on an alpine face and be in the sun. Usually we're on the north side in the shade and we don't see the sun much, but I like warm alpine climbing. It's kind of cool. So these boys, the guys are you know, farm boy and, and backies. Scott are already up on a glacier. This is a berg shrun, big, big crevasse. And there's enough uh, drifted in snow and debris here that we can get across it. We're gonna come up here, along here, a little bit of ice climbing to do here. I think we put on our crampons, actually right here, we put on our crampons and got the ropes out to start drag behind us. And Steve went out and thumped his ice axes into this and said, yeah, it's good ice, come on up. We can just solo it. So not using the rope for protection, just dragging it. And we head up here and the first business pitch is here. And then uh, we get onto this big snow ledge and we wanna go over and look at uh, the king line. And uh, yeah, yeah, interestingly, while we were on this wall, 
Um, this feature got conned by Dave Edgar and uh, Dave Mara. They called it Life by the Drip. And uh, they went to the top of the ice and came down and left it as an ice climb. And we are alpinists, so we want to get to the top. We want to create an alpine route that goes to the top of the wall, or hopefully the summit. And uh, yeah, yeah, me working up the snow, you know, everything to survive these two or three nights we have planned. A couple nights is what we had planned in my pack. And uh, here's the first uh, hard pitch that we're going to climb. And uh, yeah, Scotty. Scotty got the first one and smartly went without his pack because it proved to be a pretty darn challenging pitch. And uh, this is, you know, at first glance to the untrained eye, it looks like uh, an ice pitch, right? And uh, it is not. We call it snice, snow ice. And what's happened here in October, whatever water was present and flowing, froze up and, and froze onto the wall in October. It's now March. So a lot of that ice is delaminated away from the wall. It no longer is welded to the wall. And then all the pockets in those icicles have filled up with waves upon waves, thousands of waves of spin drifting snow. So when the wind's blowing and it's storming and or both, there's constant spin drift down these faces, unbonded loose snow just flowing down the face fills up those holes, then maybe you get some proper avalanches, some chunks of snow may end up down here, and you get snow metamorphizing towards ice and ice metamorphizing towards snow. And they meet somewhere in the middle that often provides enough structure to climb if you're careful, but rarely provides enough structure to make every ice screw good. So a risky form of climbing and lots of planting the ice hatch, scratching around, trying to get something to pull on. Sometimes black, first time, kind of tinnish gray things. Ah, yes, back. And then you'll see something that looks like uh, 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 stucco. And ah, uh, scratch, ah, uh, scratch. And no tinnish gray kind of available for that foot placement or that uh, pick placement. Scotty at the top of that pitch, he hauled his pack up, which was a good thing because when Steve and I climbed it, with our packs on and we, you know, we want to try to climb as much of the mountain with our packs on and experience the climbing as possible because that's the way Walter Benatti did it. You know, the greatest alpinist uh, to ever live actually. And uh, yeah, Walter Benatti didn't use the rope planks, the Jumars. The Jumars are a compromise and uh, one that uh, always weighs on me until I got to use them and then I just use them. <laughs> but uh, as long as we don't have to use them, it's sure cool to be able to do all the climbing. And Steve and I at the bottom, when Scotty pulled our ropes tight and said, on belay, we, you know, um, took our ice axes and tapped the heads of them together and said, to Benatti. And we both started up this, this curtain of ice that uh, Scotty had led. And it got really <laughs> quite challenging with a pack on. And great that Scotty had my 8.2 millimeter rope looking like a ballpoint pen. You had so much line tension on there because the pack wants to pull you off backwards. So nice to have that confidence from a really strong belay that Scotty organized with a good piton placement. And he had another piton placement up here that he had to stack two pins, one inside another to get enough friction and tightness to, to, to come up with enough for anchorage. So then the sun goes away and we're back into our normal uh, shady world <laughs> of the alpinist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've gone up close to the king line and we've gotten up in here somewhere, we've taken a good look and we see we can get up ice here. Then there's even a crack leading out to the ice here. But it just is so obvious that this is a totally detached feature. And as soon as we touch it, it's going to break off 35 or 30 feet above where we touch it and uh, leave us probably with something unclimbable. So when we got up there, we're taking a look and, and I said, well, yeah, you know, why don't we try the, the system I was looking at over to the right? And Steve's like, system over to the right? Like, what system's that? I said, oh, as we're approaching here, you know, I see a, a system of ice features leading up into the gully that Jock Lydon and uh, George Lowe exited in 1971 when they did the Northeast Ridge of Howe's Peak. So yeah, you know, Scott and, and uh, Steve say, yeah, well, lead on, Bubba. 
And Scott brings my attention to his helmet. And he says, hey, Bubba, how do you get a 40-year-old to climb hard? And I go, I don't know, Scotty, how do you do that? And he goes, you put a gun to their head. And he's got a sticker of a handgun on the side of his helmet to remind him to climb hard. So yeah, yeah, big traverse, 600 feet sideways, looking for any gear that you can find short ice screws in the melt water aprons of these ice faces get to rock and hope that you can clear away snow and find uh, places to put rock protection in and anchor the rope because you're all moving together and you need as many anchor points as is practical more the better you could have too much i guess but i don't think i've ever i don't know if i ever remember having too many running placements and uh yeah, this snow ledge arcing all the way over 3,500 feet over to the Mount Singe over here. Pretty interesting draw of the eye across that face. And then we get to the next business pitch, another nice pitch that uh, uh, Steve looked at and said it, it looks like uncooked pancake batter. Yeah, if you like green pancakes. But once again, tin and plaster and not enough gear to really uh, keep it as safe as you want to be. And uh, yeah, Steve went at this pitch without his pack. And uh, I remember watching him climb and, and hearing him breathe and knowing how hard he was working and how steep this climbing was actually and how far it was between pieces of equipment yeah, and he got up here and it's, you know, it's dead vertical stuff here. And he's hanging on, he gets one screw in. I'm like, great, he gets a rope clip. And he has the discipline and strength to hang out and put another screw in. Because, you know, if you get one that might hold, two is gonna give you a lot better chance of holding. And if you're carrying a dozen of these things, no use carrying them all the way up to the anchor. If you can get them in and get something that'll work, that's great. And uh, yeah, to see him, you know, traverse across here, uncover um, some rock and get a good cam placement. So suddenly the risk goes way, way down. And then, yeah, just see him dance up here, climbing, climbing about as good as, as a human being can climb on ice. So there's Scotty's pitch there. There's my big 600 foot traverse. And then Steve is climbing up uh, this chunk of ice here. And he got anchored into good screws at the top. It was getting late in the day. And I punched steps out over here. It kind of looks like a manta ray. I called this the manta ray ice face. Right against this rock is where we got our first snow cave. So the first place where we spend the night. And a long go across with the worries of if a slab is in here, you know, and it, we have a slab avalanche, we're going over this cliff. So that ain't gonna feel good. But thankfully no slabs. And sometimes, a lot of time, no slabs in these things because they get, so much spin drifting that there's compaction and uh, energy and bonding in the snow. Don't take that to the bank. If there's snow scientists working, listening to this, go up and do some research on these alpine faces, you guys. We can use some of this info. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, the king line here. And uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, we get up, I get anchored in rock. The, the, the guys come up and we start digging the snow cave. Always a lot of work. You know, as they're, uh, yeah, they get up and we put shovel blades on our ice axes. We start the hard work, two, three hours to dig a decent snow cave. And not a lot of snow depth here. So we went in about three feet a meter. We hit rocks. So we had to go sideways, both ways to make a torpedo tube. And yeah, yeah. So that's the master bedroom. And uh, yeah, as we're, you know, it's dark now and we're taking turns going inside, digging both ways, put out an insulite pad so you can lie on an insulite pad as you hack away at the snow, which is pretty darn well bonded actually. Maybe I can do enough snow science up there that I can come to these conclusions, write a paper or something. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we see headlights down at Kefren Lake on this end of Kefren Lake. There's other people there and I yodel. <laughs> And we get yippies and yahoos in return. And we see these headlights dancing around down there like fireflies. And uh, it's like, oh man, are they coming for the same line? So 
you know, instantly competitiveness. <laughs> and then Steve is like, ah, oh, we're a day ahead of them. They'll never catch up with us if they are coming for this line. And Steve didn't even consider this line. So likely they probably were looking at this, but it was Dave and Dave and they were actually heading over here. And then it's like, oh, cool. A couple other humans. Oh, how cool. You know, some other people drawn to the mountain. Um, yeah, and then uh, we kind of uh, could hear them and couldn't see them again because they get in over here and just can't see because the mountain bulges out and can't see. But yeah, um, in our snow cave, the torpedo tube, number one, and uh, Steve and I have uh, uh, three pound and two pound uh, sleeping bags uh, each. I have a three pounder, I think, and Steve has a two pounder or two And Scotty pulls out this compression sack out of his pack and pops the compression straps. And this thing just explodes, kind of like cookie dough in one of those tubes from Pillsbury Doughboy when you go pop. So this, this bag explodes. And I'm like, Scotty, how big is that bag? Six pounds, brother, six pounds. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. He's like, what can I say? I'm aged and saved. And then he's feigning kind of astonishment. Oh my, an in-flight pillow. I forgot about that. Yeah, right. So Scotty's got an in-flight pillow to boot. <laughs> and uh, Steve and Scott shared the master bedroom and I got the kids room, which I equated to kind of like being a, a hot dog inside a bun. That's what it felt like. But you're inside, you seal off the door and start the stove. You have ventilation holes and uh, yeah, it warms up. The, the walls glaze over with a bit of uh, melted uh, it's water and it refreezes. And it gets really warm and quiet in there. And uh, you spend a couple hours, you know, melting snow to get rehydrated. And towards the end of the night, getting quite late, Steve handed me a Pop-Tart. And I'm thinking, wow, strawberry Pop-Tart. How cool. Steve catered um, dessert. What a guy. So I eat my Pop-Tart. And then in the morning, it's my turn to run the stove. So my alarm watch I have on my top of my head inside my toque so I can hear it and feel it vibrate through my skull at 4 a.m. And it's like, a, I don't know, a bird pecking on the top of your head. So kind of wrestle your hands up, get to the watch, excuse me, turn it off and then light up the stove and start the process of brewing. And we used to carry these uh, Folgers singlets these single coffee tea bags, coffee in a tea bag. It's always been such a joy in these bivouacs to take that little per, that little metal foil package and rip along the scissor line and smell that coffee in the morning, that first walk to coffee. And then I'm the only one up so far. I haven't woken up the guys because there's no reason to yet. So I get to rip open the other two actually and get three wafts of coffee. Soon I have three cups of coffee, wake up the guys and hand them about and and Steve, who is the, you know, young tiger alpinist at this point with the two 40 year olds, you know, he's like, wow, Baba, you already have the stove going. I was sound asleep. I said, yeah, here, have some coffee. So yeah, my turn, because the snow climbing didn't count the night before. So I get the first lead and I'm heading out to this arching feature of rock in one of the steeper parts of the face. I don't have to have my pack, that's great and just amazing, it's nice climbing. Not as hard as Steve or Scotty's leads the day before, and that's fine, I don't mind that. It's like grade four, but just such a great position and, and just so wild. You know, when I first met Scott up in the Alaska range in 1983, I think it was, maybe it was 85, and, uh, you know, we were talking at the airstrip um, where you would land to go to Denali, formerly known as Mount McKinley. Um, and uh, he was uh, with Bill Bancroft going to try a route on the Mount Hunter. Um, yeah, amazing mountain. And we we're just talking about, you know, how no planes had landed for eight days. And there's a hundred people wanting to get out of the Alaska range. And the day before some guy puts uh kitty toboggans on his arms like wings and runs down the airstrip which is on a glacier flapping these kitty uh kitty sleds on his his arms like wings and everyone's laughing but everybody wants to get out of there 
Scotty and I are talking and he's like, man, all these people want to leave and all I want to do is be up there. And I'm like, yeah, brother, I hear you. You know, all I want to do is climb in the Alpine. That's all I want to do. And uh, yeah, he looks at me and he says, yeah, sometimes I look down at my crampon points, see him stuck in the ice. And I look down and I just go, this is so wild. And uh, yeah, pretty wild up here. And uh, yeah, you can see the tracks coming over from the night before and our snow cave against the rock here. And I'm now very, very envious because they have got the sunshine. I don't have the sunshine. And to quote Eddie Murphy, because my dad is an alcoholic and we are on the welfare. <laughs> Anyways, so they got sunshine. I got no sunshine. <laughs> Ain't no sunshine <laughs> when they're gone. So the boys come up and you can see the snice climbing where we're tying off ice screws often because they go through and hit rock. Hopefully they go through ice that's bonded to rock. Often they pass through ice that is not bonded to rock. So once again, serious, even if it not technically all that difficult. And I should backtrack here. So we're heading up this arch. Scotty's going to do a long lead, take us up to here. And then the farm boy is going to traverse towards, this is actually an overhang. And this dollop of snow like these ones have plastered themselves to the undersides of the overhangs. As the spin drifting comes down the face, as it clears an overhang, there's a rotor. And the spin drift rotors in and bonds and, uh, you know, encrusts the overhangs with these aprons. So the, this is really steep here is what I'm getting at. And then there's a roof, like a 10 foot roof under that blob of snow. And then there's one strip of ice, hard to see, right up here, 80 feet long, a meter wide, and so a yard wide, and never more than an inch to an inch and a half, maybe two inches of snice once in a while. So an amazingly uh, thin, beautiful, aesthetic, and such a serious piece of climbing uh, to do. Um, but back to me getting to my anchor and uh, Scotty coming out and climbing out into the sun. So we don't get to do that that often, do this that often. Like I said, we're usually in the shade. So pretty cool to see Scotty head out there into the sun, yet still looking at these features. And these things weigh a number of metric tons. And, uh, you know, when they fail, they are a form of avalanche and they can definitely, you know, kill humans and cause humans a lot of damage and they can trigger uh, other forms of avalanche, slab avalanches. Scotty heading up and uh, tying off ice screws and maybe running it out a bit to go a little faster because this climbing kind of similar to mine, probably grade four-ish might get up to grade five-ish up here where he ends up anchoring and uh, bringing up Steve and I. And uh, looks like we're coming up on the Jumars this time, probably trying to make some time. And then Scotty from his anchor, and anchoring is so difficult on these faces. Um, you need a lot of skill to do this. It probably goes without saying, a lot of skill to do this type of climb. You got to have a lot of things, uh, a lot of experience in a lot of things. Not the least of which is uh, rock climbing and getting anchors in, in loose, uh, loose rock. So yeah, the anchoring often takes some time. And uh, then we hand over to Steve and Steve heads up here. We see two options over this overhang. He tries out an option here and one of these snow mushrooms peels away when he touches it with his ax and you can see it drag his ax off to the side and we all go, ah, crap, hold tight to the belay. And you can see it jerk across his shoulders and um, then he decides, no, it's not gonna go here. I'm gonna come down and check out the other side here. So some good ice screws, some, some bronzy kind of uh, tinted uh, ice here because there's a shale band in here. So shale is bleeding into the melt water that eventually forms ice and gives it this golden kind of tinge. So Steve, he clears out the snow here and he's got, he's either got to commit to the roof go over the roof or he's coming back and we're going down. It's just too hard, right? And man, he has his feet wide. And uh, yeah, he had a good cam in here, a large cam. 
and suddenly kind of looked like Muhammad Ali working his footwork, balletic footwork, precision. And then he just stepped over the edge of that roof. And that's kind of last we saw him for three hours, three hours of paying out rope as he slowly went up that 80 foot strip of ice. And, you know, Scott and I are getting cold and uh, we're switching the belay off and back and we're like, man, how does, how, how come Steve always gets the hard pitches? And Scott looks at me and goes, because God knows, man, God knows. <laughs> Is he going to make it? Only God knows, man. Only God knows. So finally, you know, we hear off the lay and then another half hour, you know, okay, you know, secure. And Scotty and I are going to Jumar. It's getting later in the day. We got to get going. And I'm first up on the rope clamps of Jumars. I get over the lip and I see this thing. And it could have came from my imagination. It could have came from the mountains of my mind. It was like a brush stroke in a Japanese watercolor. Just one perfect silver tassel of ice with little four inch overlaps in it. So little tiny overhangs and just this amazing thinness. And it was just one of the greatest, probably the greatest lead in the mountains I've ever witnessed. And, uh, you know, even though we're going up on the rope clamps, you understand what he's gone through. Seeing how he's gotten some rock gear where it's available, micro cams and shallowly driven pitons, no ice gear. There's nowhere deep enough for ice gear. And coming to the little overlaps and seeing the scratch marks on the rock beside the ice where he's looking for something into the rock that will hold an ice pick or a crampon. Sometimes finding, sometimes not. And then I remember I had blown away and this is just, just vertical and mildly overhanging Jumar. And so I come up to one of these little four inch roofs and I look over top of the roof, there's an ice depth of maybe three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch. So very difficult to get the tip of the ice ax in. And I see he's cut away a ledge, constructed a ledge and made it the length of my finger, the length of a match, the width of my finger. And he's laid the pick of his ice ax on it sideways to get more ice depth and be able to pull very precisely down and advance and maybe tap in a tool and keep going. So, yeah, yeah, right at the, you know, I got up to the end of the ropes and he was out of rope, had to untie from the ropes, anchored to a cluster of five ice screws and a hubcap piece size of ice. And that was the only ice. So some of them are tied off, some of them are sunk in, kind of looks like some weird kind of form of porcupine. And then he tied his two prussics together. So another 30 meters that he let out on, got up to rock, put in a half a dozen pieces of rock gear, brought it all to a focal point and had enough anchorage that Scott and I could do more. And uh, yeah, the amount of skill in that sentence is uh, you don't come by that light. You got to put in lots and lots of days to be able to come up with that, uh, that kind of solution. So yeah, I got up there first and I remember I got up and I made eye contact with him. I'm like, oh my God, farm boy, I don't know how you climb that. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, it was pretty intense. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of went to a different place. And, you know, I, I, could, I knew the place he had gone to where initially pulling over the overhang, the risk of falling and the eventually the you know, what becomes a lethal threat that if you lose it, it's quite likely you're going to die because you're going to fall a hundred feet or something and slam into a wall. So it's a good chance you're really going to get hurt or you're going to get dead. But you deal with it for so long that that overwhelming, threatening noise initially that makes you scared eventually just turns down and it becomes the elevator noise in the background. Gravity kind of becomes a song. And you just concentrate on what you're doing and you come up with this performance or Steve came up with this performance. And I look back to Scotty here and I looked out to Scotty and I said, Scotty, what do you think? Eh? And he looked down, he looked back up and he said, I consider myself pretty good at this kind of climbing. I think I could have second this, but I couldn't have let it. And, you know, he looked again and he said, I think there's maybe a dozen people in the world who could put this pitch together without breaking it. So yeah, Steve uh, 
was a climbing genius for those 80 feet and also a rigging genius. <laughs> Some of the <laughs> stuff you got to go through to get good anchorage on these, these climbs, uh, lots of uh, lots to put together. So my turn, we're looking for a place to spend the night. And now we're underneath the 500 foot triangular ice face not ice face, sorry, rock face that is overhanging and has these mushrooms on top. So, you know, I've scoped out that we're not going to be able to climb that, but there's a traverse line that might get us into Jock and uh, George's uh, couloir. So initially this wave of snow in the gully we're in and no place for a snow cave here. We got to get up here. I try over here and I'm just about to pull over, but there's nothing to pull over on. There's no solid placement. My pick keeps ratcheting through the snow and then my right pick slips an inch. Like I'm coming down boys and a little bit of ice in here for a foot. You could step on that and I came down and I tried the other side and I've cleared off a curtain of snow here and in behind is rock and now I'm aid climbing up the rock. So direct aid climbing, putting in gear, putting the rope ladder on it and advancing that way and that worked. And uh, so yeah, the pitch was in here, the pitch. And then we're up in here and this is where we're gonna get our second snow cave. And there's the tr large triangular face with the big snow mushrooms on top. And here's the traverse that I hope will get us into this exit gully that Jock and George got into in 71. And there, I know there's alpine ice in there, so permanent ice. So we get into the snow cave and uh, you know, we listened, uh, uh, well, we didn't get into the snow cave actually. Um, we started digging the snow cave. We got tired, it got late. We were going sideways, we'd hit rock and we were just all darn tired. And I, uh, you know, we said, okay, I, I said, I think this will work. I'll just put my feet out on the belay ledge out without a roof over them. And it's supposed to be good weather. So this will work. And in the night it started to storm and I wake up in the morning and there's a tombstone high pyramid of snow encasing my legs from the like mid thigh down to the foot and it's set up hard and I'm like ah oh, crap and I can feel the cold it's it's made my sleeping bag wet between my the heat of my body and the snow melting uh, my sleeping bag's wet so it's a mistake um it's gonna cost <laughs> and uh yeah I gotta punch at this tombstone and break it up to get it off my feet and it's, it's storming, the spinger is coming down. So yeah, I hold my feet up and hopefully make a, a shell so that my feet are below the snow this time. And I don't bother waking up the lads um, because there's no need, you can't go up in this. So finally, yeah, you know, the guys wake up, we have our coffee, I get to sniff all three again. And uh, yeah, we have a conversation, you know, it's like, yeah, damn can't go up in this. Well, we got enough food and fuel. Let's make the snow cave a lot bigger. Let's get inside and we, we can wait a day. You know, my party isn't for a couple of days down the road. So, you know, if it clears up and stops storming, even today, what's supposed to be, we would have enough time, you know, if it happens at 10 in the morning, we could still get over, get up and get back down to here. Just leave all the bivy gear here. And Scotty's like, man, you know, I'm willing to write off all my bivy gear if we could go up and over the top and get this route done. And both Scott and I are thinking, we don't want Steve's lead to be lost in the catacombs of Alpine climbing history with a route that isn't completed. So we want to, to finish this thing and have that lead as, as the key to this, this amazing adventure. So yeah, we dig out the snow cave, make it a lot bigger, make it like a three three bedroom condo. So we all get a bunch more comfortable. We block off the, the wall and probably 14 times that day, we asked Steve, you know, remove one of the snow blocks. What, what does it look like? Oh man, it's still storming. So put the snow block back and we talk about a lot of stuff. We talk about punk music and we talk about climbing, of course. We solve all the problems that exist globally between uh, in alpinism and also the problems, the challenges that exist between alpinists and their partners. And yeah, I wish that we had written some of that down because we could have could have remembered it. <laughs> but um, yeah, had a really good time. 
got to know these guys a lot better in that snow cave. And I knew them both pretty well, but I got to know them a lot better. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we get my radio out at late in the day, we're high enough, we can get the Environment Canada repeating forecast on my radio. It says tomorrow, 12 hours of good weather. We're like, okay, cool, we're gonna get our chance. In the morning, Steve, take the block of snow out. What does it look like? He says, too, too dark to tell. So we brew up, we pack up. Steve, what does it look like? And uh, he looks out and he goes, looks like Niagara Falls version of snow. It's still storming and spin drifting constantly. And it's like, God ah, damn it, we got to go down. And Scotty says, well, let's eat all our food. <laughs> so we pretty much eat all our food. And as we're doing that, Scott and I are having these thoughts about the pitch. We've started calling it the pitch. And Scotty looks at me and Steve and he goes, why don't we just put on the goggles, put up our hoods, cinch down our Velcro and just see if we can climb up through this, see if we can go up. And Steve never expected that two 40 year olds would want it as bad as he did a 25 year old. And, you know, I said to Scott, you've been reading my mail, man. I've been thinking the exact same thing. So if we can get up and off down Kefren, we can just leave all our bivy gear here and maybe go find it in the spring at the bottom of the wall. Or we can come back to here. We can always retreat back to here. And going down from here on a day like today is going to be no worse than going down tomorrow on a day like today. So we decided to go up. And the farm boy was pretty darn happy about that. The two 40-year-olds <laughs> wanting it as bad as a farm boy. And Scotty took off in the lead. And there's that, the beginning of that triangular, 500 foot high triangular face. Scotty moving together with Steve and I, putting in gear. Scotty led for 800 feet across what we, a feature we, we named the Peruvian Traverse because we hadn't seen flutings and snow ridges like this, shaped like this many places in the Rockies, if anywhere in the Rockies. A lot in Peru, a lot in the Himalaya, but uh, man, to be climbing across this in the Rockies was pretty unique. And the day was amazingly unique in that everything's in motion. You know, you don't see it as much in a still photograph, but snow is constantly hissing over you. You're, you're, you know, and then it hisses heavier and everything's gray. And sometimes you lose sight of the ropes, like the red rope disappears five feet in front of you in mist and spin drifting snow and snow that isn't moving is put in motion by your climbing. Everything's moving. It's it's pretty wild and maybe a little disorienting. You can see the snow piling up, even though I'm climbing, you know, on my pack. And then the, every so often you get a clearing in the tunnel through the clouds and you can see across the highway, two miles distance, these stroboscopic passing windows of visibility and the muscular shoulders of clouds that are tumbling over Howe's Peak. Uh, juxtaposed against layers of cloud in the background. Once again, kind of like being in a Japanese watercolor and uh, pretty amazing. And uh, we're actually digging it. We're having a pretty darn good gay old time of ourselves, gay in the sense of gaiety of, wow, this is wild. As Scotty says, he looks down at his crampons and he goes, this is so wild. And he gets to the end of the 800 feet, gets an anchor, stamps out a platform, Steve and I come over and the gully, George and Jock's gully is 70 feet to the side and down probably 30 feet. So we got to repel off uh, Scotty's anchor and then get over to this, this uh, uh, exit gully. And it's my turn. So I, you know, repel down, we're gonna leave one of our ropes fixed here to facilitate a retreat if we have to come back this way. We take off with one rope. I go down and lead in, and this gully is just alive. There's snow coming out of it. Kind of looks like a river. <laughs> snow coming out of all, all the time. And a little bit of borderline madness here in that I'm trying to get up over this first little steep part and get in the gully, and I'm working on getting an ice screw. I get it one turn in. <laughs> I got to hang on to my ice axes as tons of unbonded snow hammer down over my shoulders and my head and my bowed face. And I can feel the vibration of my ice axe, the energy and rumbling of the snow. 
and then it passes and then it's back to heavy snowfall. I can get another couple turns and then watch out, another avalanche. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is, this is madness. Can I get up here? And uh, finally get the screw in and clipped and pull over and get out of the concentration there. And I make it to an anchor. And I think to myself, a quote from Warren Harding, um, great, uh, first ascent of the nose reel in El Capitan. And uh, yeah, Warren's great quote. I guess I climbed because I'm mad, but it's a fine kind of madness. And it felt really good to get to an anchor underneath a wall and have the guys come up and come up to me and say, man, Bubba, we thought you were coming back. Uh, at least 10 times we thought you were coming back. And good work, brother. Good work. How to hang in there. So we're in this upper gully. And uh, the spin drifts are coming down. And the farm boy takes off. And we go rope length by rope length now. Because we need to be anchored as much as possible. And leading one of these, leaving one of these anchors, uh, Scott and I are tied together on the end of the rope. Um, probably about three, three meters apart. And a big spin drift comes down. We're just leading the anchor. It knocks Scott off. And Scott goes, you know, falling by me. I scream. There's the thunder of the avalanche. And uh, I get pulled on, but I don't get pulled off. And I see the rope scratch. I feel it on my waist. Scotty's sideways. The thing moves on. He gets up and shakes it off. And we get up to Steve. And he's, you know, he's aware that the rope had some tension on it. But you didn't even know that Scotty had got knocked off his feet. And that's how challenging the communication is in this gully. And there's Scotty, I think just when he got back on after getting knocked off his feet. And we're still going up. And eventually we round the corner here and we get into here. And this cornice is, honest to God, 10 meters out in space. It's probably 25 meters across, maybe 30 meters. So it's dimensions of, I don't know, a rail car or something. And we can see it growing with the wind and the spin drift. You can see flakes of snow failing off its belly. And it's just so spooky. But we're, we're going down. We're not touching that thing. So our route ends here. And if anyone ever repeats our route, maybe they can get around that cornice. Well, actually, uh, Scott Semple, Will Gadd, and, and Kevin Mahoney uh, did a route up here and avoided it and got to the summit actually they had really nice weather um and uh yeah 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 i just remember a, a passage from uh i don't know which, which book it was but about the hulk the bull bulk the, the, the hull of a ship in the mediterranean that's bulging and flakes of metal are falling off of it and actually captain and crew abandon the ship and then it doesn't go down right so I had that image in my head. <laughs> so we're getting out of here. 30 meter rappels. And we did, uh, uh, I think five full rope planks up in this gully. So, you know, the whole route has 15 technical pitches and five of them are in this gully, five or six. And uh, yeah, we're Ward and I were in 88 over here. But so <clears throat> 30 meter rappels, each and every anchor, we leave a brand new Turbo Express ice screw and a brand new hot wire carabiner that we tape shut. And uh, I'm like, man, shouldn't we be doing a Bellicops or something? And both uh, uh, Steve and Scott are sponsored by Black Diamond. And Scotty looks at me and goes, you know, our, our, our main man there, one of our brothers in the Alpine, uh, Bill Belcourt, is uh, Billy, the head of uh, hardware climbing design. And Scotty looks at me and goes, Belcourt will give us more swag just for the stories. <laughs> so each and every rappel off a brand new ice crew, $100 anchor, each one of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we rappel on down and uh, still spin drifting, still storming, get to our fixed rope, come up the fixed rope on the Jumars. And uh, we're thinking this is pretty cool. And around this time, I hear the thumping of a helicopter way, way down there somewhere. So I get out my radio and I call the, the, the National Park Service on their radio repeater or talk to the helicopter, maybe on his frequency, but I talk to the people in the helicopter and it's like my buddy Gord Irwin and, uh, and Mark Ludwig. And, and Mark is like, 
I say it hits Barry Blanchard on House Peak. Um, yeah, it's Mark in the helicopter. He's a mountain guide, and it's like, yeah, Catherine, your wife, uh, you know, you're you're getting close to overdue, so we we're flying up here anyway. She wanted to check out, see if we were okay. And he's, where are you guys? I said, well, man, we're up at like ten thousand feet, traversing back towards our snow cave. Where are you? Oh, we're way lower than that. <laughs> so they're underneath the the ceiling of this storm that we're in. And uh, yeah, we're okay. We're planning to be back down tomorrow. You know, we'll make contact when we get off the mountain to let us let you guys know we're okay. So we go back across the 800 foot Peruvian Traverse. Scotty leads us back. And then we rappel down to our snow cave. And probably the last happy picture of me where, wow, what a day, you know, we've done this route. And uh, yeah, I'm at the last anchor above uh, the snow cave and it's cold it's dark it's snowing and not as much wind now not as much spin drift just snowfall stellar snowflakes coming out of the sky and I can see them in my headlight shattering against the rock and if I hold my breath hear them impacting my helmet and the hood of my jacket and my shoulders and uh, yeah I can see our ropes Scotty's made the anchor there's a shallow angle angled piton that he's pounded on so hard that it's bent and then there's cord tying it to an ice screw in the frothy gray ice on the edge of the couloir all through a focal point our rappel ropes are in there and they're rigid with steve's body weight and i'm waiting for steve to shout out off rappel and from the night i hear off rappel and it's dark and it's cold and somewhere out in the darkness is a deeper shade of darkness and I can feel this darkness and okay, I get on my rappel device on and I'm about to unclip from the anchor. And it's like on the periphery of my vision, this, this deeper darkness flaps like a raven's wing. And I hear this immense crack. And then I hear the acceleration of one of these snow mushrooms coming off the top of the 500 foot rock face, the overhanging rock face. And it's screaming through the air as it, you know, presses arrow from under it. <gasps> and then come, boom, it explodes in the gully above me. And then it hits me with a force that is just so inhuman and so overwhelming that I immediately have the physical illusion that I've been swept off the mountain and I'm rocketing down this couloir. Next, I expect to be shot out and feel my belly raise and free fall and then to start hammering into the lower slopes of the mountain and probably hearing my skeleton shatter through my body. And I think I'm dying. And that illusion goes on for a number of seconds. And then I realize, no, I'm getting hammered against the rock wall and I'm getting beat up in the flow of this avalanche, which is not loose snow. It's bonded, firm cornice material. So cinder blocks being pressed through a 10 foot hourglass in the mountain. And I'm in the hourglass too. And I keep getting pounded. And then it, it rages off and rages down the mountain and then goes away. And then everything goes silent. It always goes quiet and it hisses away down the gray ice. And Steve is shouting from below, Barry, Barry, Baba. And I'm, you know, just trembling and, and I can see that uh, my headlamp is bobbing around by my neck because it's been ripped off my helmet. My gloves are half torn off and there's manacles of firmly bonded snow around my wrists. And the ice screw has been pulled out of the ice and it's dangling. And I'm hanging by Scotty's beautifully overdriven piton. God bless Scotty. God bless Scotty for making his elbow hurt. He pounded on that piece of metal so hard. And I'm in under a little bulge on the side of the, of the couloir where Scotty put the anchor to get a bit of protection. Had I not had that protection, I, you're talking the difference of one foot of exposure, I think I would have been swept off the mountain. The, the anchor would have failed. So yeah, Steve's screaming. I'm in shock and I scream down to him, I'm okay which is a lie. I'm not okay. And then I have a cough and I see blood and snot and 
you know, fear come out of me onto the snow and I break up the manacles and I get my hands into the gloves that don't want to receive them. And I look at the piton, I'm hanging by it. I got to get the ice screw back in. I untie the ice screw, get it back in the ice, tie it in again. And yeah, I've got to repel. My pack's been ripped off my back and uh, my leg, I know I broke my leg when I slammed into the side of the wall. My right leg won't support weight and I know it's screwed. So I get the rappel together and I start hopping down and I get to level with Steve beside the snow cave. He's under the overhang there, so he's protected. He saw the rage and the energy of the avalanche, heard it, got buried by spin drifting snow beside it, but he didn't get hit by it. And, you know, I come down and he grabs me underneath the arms, lifts me up onto this ledge like I'm a toddler coming out of a pool and he's my dad. And he looks in my eyes and I just saw horror flash in his eyes. And I, I could finally just, I just fell into his arms and like, oh my God, I thought I was, thought I was being killed. And Steve's, you know, start crying and oh, Baba, Baba, oh my God, Scotty, get out here. Barry's been hit. What? Scotty was in the snow cave. He didn't even realize that that kind of avalanche had occurred because he's so insulated within that snow cave. So Scotty and Steve go to work on me. And I just basically, they just handle me, get me in the cave, get me in Scotty's sleeping bag, get me insulated. And, uh, you know, they use the last of our fuel to make a, a liter of hot water for me to put between my thighs to heat my femoral arteries and start getting me warm. The very last of our fuel, they make me a cup of tea and they have nothing. <laughs> and after, you know, an hour of being in the snow cave, my breathing's down. Steve checks my pulse for the second time, 80. Man, that's way better than what it was. Checks my eyes. Uh, wow, you're no longer dilated, that's cool. And how do you feel? And I've been working at getting my breathing under control. I said, I'm, I'm warmed up, this is, this is good. He said, we should look at your knee. So, you know, a bunch of zippers to get through and clothing, get to my knee. It's the size of a big honeydew melon and it's got yellow and purple and magenta and black and green and all kinds of colors that aren't supposed to be in your knee. So it's pretty buggered. And uh, yeah, um, it, uh, yeah, we get in and, uh, you know, I get out my radio and think, should should we call for a rescue? And we think, nah, can you get, you know, there, can you get down, Bubba? I think I can rappel. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do the traverses or can't do the skiing. So we're thinking about that. And my radio, when I look at it, we listen to a weather report on it and there's a snow crystals inside the screen. Snow has been blasted into this highly hermetically sealed electronic device. And that's the energy of this hit within my, my clothing. The radio guy who tried to fix it said he'd never seen anything like it, but it still works. We get the weather forecast. Tomorrow it's gonna start to break. Okay, well, let's see what tomorrow brings. And, uh, yeah, I'm in Scotty's big blue sleeping bag and time to go to sleep. Scotty gets in behind me and spoons me and uh, I, he's like, man, this is going to be comfy, Bubba. And I say, Scotty, we got to be careful of spooning. It could lead to forking. And we all laugh. So <laughs> we were feeling better. And uh, Scott and I are sleeping in the sleeping bag and somewhere in the middle of the night, you know, the night fear comes, it's black inside the snow cave. And I start worrying about losing control and dying, which isn't, you know, it's not an impossibility. So I get my radio out, I screw it together and I turn it on and off four or five times and it won't come on, it's not working. That's like, oh God, I was gonna call for a rescue, which is, you know, I spent my whole life pursuing autonomous alpinism. So this is a defeat in that. And also uh, uh, another defeat because I haven't consulted my partners about this, but I can't do it anyways, radio doesn't work. Put it back in and say, okay, tomorrow morning I'll talk to the, the guys about what we're gonna do and suggest rescue if we can somehow communicate that. Maybe the radio will come back to life. And uh, yeah, that felt better to have a plan. So. In the morning, we start out and I'm in the middle hopping down the rappels. And uh, yeah, we're 
back here. So we're repelling fall line down here. And we actually get to the top of Scotty's pitch. And uh, I think we have more of a fall line descent here because we're at this anchor. And I have been hopping down the repels on one foot and uh, of course no pack. And uh, I'm at the anchor and I decide, well, I'll just try it. And here's the ground we climbed up the day before. And there's the pitch. Hard to get a, a picture of it, but there's Steve's magic. And this snow has already reformed this apron below that overhang because Steve had knocked all that snow away. Um, and, you know, I get out the radio, I screw it together and it comes on. I turn it on and I go climbers on House Peak for, you know, Banff, uh, uh, Banff Park. And my buddy Gord Irwin answers immediately. He goes, hey, Barry, it's Gord. How are you doing? I said, Gord, we could really use some help getting off House Peak. And he said, not to worry. We're on our way. We're on our way right now. And, you know, I told the boys and they're like, well, we don't need a rescue. So we're going to continue on with the retreat. And soon after the whomping of the helicopter comes up the valley and my friend Lance Cooper is flying and he does an amazing piece of flying in a long ranger. So he didn't have his brand new 407s with four rotors, which is a lot better machine for mountain rescue. Mark Ledwidge, guy, you know, I've known for a long, long time, fellow, fellow mountain guide, public safety specialist, comes in the end of this, I don't know what it is, 100 foot line. And, uh, you know, to keep our morale up on the descent, Stephen and uh, Scott and I are so hungry now. We ran out of food yesterday. What I'm talking about is, okay, we get off this, we go to Banff. There was a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Banff at that time. We're going to get a family bucket of KFC and we're just going to start eating it all again more. So, yeah, we're just talking about KFC all the time. And, uh, yeah, Mark comes in and sends Lance away. Lance does some amazing flying. Mark comes in and clips into the anchor. And I immediately draw his attention to the fact that our anchor is my spare Gravel mix pick in case I break one of my ice picks. We've got this spare one that I can put on and still have a functional ice axe. It's a beefier pick. We've run out of pitons. All our 12 pitons have left in anchors. So we're using this as a piton. And then there's a micro cam here. And I say to Mark, yeah, that's a you know spare pick and a micro cam. And he's like, I wish you didn't tell me that. <laughs> and this was so beef that after Mark and I flew away, uh, you know, Scott went down first and Steve pulled the micro cam and wrapped just off the mix pick. It was so bombers, basically a piton. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so strange to, to have Mark and I clip together on the end of the long line and then feel the power of the helicopter just kind of undeniably lifting you away from the mountain. And at the very last minute, Scott, the eternal opportunist, clipped his pack to the back of my harness so he wouldn't have to carry it down the mountain and out to the road. So yeah, and in this picture, there's a cave over here where there's a lot of modern mix climbing, bolt protected sport climbing, going out very hard mixed moves to get to ice daggers. And at this point in time, we had a lot of competition between the traditional alpinists, which we were, and the uh, mix guys over here and M8 was a really hard grade. So we ended up calling the route that we created M16 twice as hard as M8, which was a poke in the ribs and it worked because they, the guys got up and put a route up on house peak. And uh, yeah, it was also a really big gun to make a 40 year old climb hard. So I flew out to the highway and uh, got in the truck. They looked at my knee, took me to the hospital. Uh, the ER doc said, okay, you cracked your tibia and uh, the, the, the knees inflated with fluid and blood and stuff. It'll all get reabsorbed over the next three weeks. The crack will here, will heal, be on crutches for two days, and then weight bear. Don't go running downhill with a heavy pack, but just keep on your leg. It's going to be fine. So, yeah, that night I showed up at the Drake on crutches. And uh, uh, very soon after, Scott and uh, Steve showed up. And this is Steve going away from Howe's Peak with my skis on his pack. And uh, 
um, reflecting the shape of the peak in behind. So life imitating art or art imitating life. And uh, yeah, 10 years later, the boys were down in uh, Colorado and they sent me this picture. And uh, it would have been 2009 of putting a big gun to a 40 year old's head to make them climb hard. And Steve would have been 35 at the time and Scott, of course, a lot older. And in the article that we wrote about this climb, Steve contributed a paragraph when we were at the bar, people everywhere congratulating us, slapping us on the back, reinforcing the high. Barry sits at a table with his leg elevated and people all around him. The room is packed to the point that you can't move to refill your glass. No need as more beer comes through, bought on by the back slappers and congratulators. The praise feels good and then empty as I look at Barry. He was my hero once upon a time, but now I know him as I know few people. Yesterday, I thought I was watching him die. There is no pride in that, only shame. Shame in the deepest sense of failure. I am the youth and I wanted. I wanted enough that I couldn't face descending from all from that wall. I couldn't make the toughest decision, the right decision without pity for myself without hollow, meaningless hate for the storm. And Scotty, in the same room, wrote, I always look for answers where there can be none. I want to know if we were right in continuing or if we were just fools. The company at the party raises my mood. Friends I haven't seen in years are there. And yet as I walk back into the night towards sleep and forgetfulness, I hear myself answering the riddle. You did the wrong thing for the right reasons and you got away with it. Barry's going to be fine in a few weeks. And the only answer is that all decisions are made based on incomplete information. And in the mountains, you end up being completely responsible for the outcome. Yeah. So another 10 years down the road, um, well, at the time, the topo that I drew for M16 and reference to the King line and uh, 2019, 20 years down the road, Josh Ross Kelly, Hans Jorgauer and David Lama amazingly climbed the wall in, in one day and uh, I know I've known Jess Ross Kelly since he was a teenager. I've known his dad for over 30 years since the mid eighties. And John, Jess's dad was the strongest Himalayan climber in the mid eighties period, stronger than Mesner. And uh, yeah, I had the great serendipitous good fortune of working with Jess and John at the uh, Munising Ice Fest in February, 2019, about a week before I had a total right hip replacement. And we were on the edge of Superior, uh, Lake Gichigumi, <laughs> and the wind was screaming off the lake, like gale force wind, difficult to stand. And we're at the top of this ice climb, considering lowering our clients down to climb up. And it's kind of insanity. And Jess and I are out at the edge and it's and Jess looked at me and he's such a humorous guy I always saw the humor in everything especially had to do with like uh, farts <laughs> but he looks at me and he, he goes man this place is good training for Patagonia so I lower Jess over and he comes climbing up and chunks of ice are coming up on the wind and you know he gets over the top and he staggers over to me and he goes I had it wrong Patagonia has good training for this place and it was great to share that day with Jess and John and Jess showed up with those two uh, David and Hans Jorg in April and got a hold of me I hadn't been in the field so I didn't have a whole bunch that I could help with, with conditions or stuff, but it was great to talk to Jess and talk a little bit about what they were planning. And I got excited about the fact that they were going to, to house peak, very similar to the picture 
with that snow leading out to Mount Singe over there. And yeah, amazing that these guys climbed that wall in one day, really well uh, summary and uh, kind of conclusions uh, related by his dad. And after they were overdue, you know, I called John the next day and he was already driving up and uh, you know, I, I just lost it. I just started, yeah, I started crying as, as you know, John had been doing a lot of that himself and John knew the story. He just said, you know, I know my son's dead and I just want to come up and bring him home. And uh, yeah, was able to help a bit with having that come about. So yeah, House of Cards, actually, I think it goes out over here, M16. And then where uh, Jess and Hans Jorg and uh, David climbed in one day, absolutely amazing. I think they went all the way to the top of House Peak, which you can't see because it's on the other side, but somewhere on the descent, they were avalanched and probably got shot over this cliff, which is well, 700 to 1,000 feet of largely vertical ground. And of course, we're, we're killed and buried by the avalanche at the bottom. So pretty sober way to end um, this episode. But uh, I will mention that the next episode is the last one. And we're going to do it next Tuesday. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be talking about uh, um, a route called Sands Blitz on the east face of Mount Fay after yet another thwarted attempt, a couple attempts to put a route up on the Emperor face of Mount Robson, and then finally succeeding on a route on the Emperor face of Mount Robson. But let me mention, the night after the party, I went upstairs in my condo and Steve and Scotty, the farm boy and Scotty were asleep on the, on the living room floor. I went to the fridge and there was a bucket of KFC with one breast left in it one piece of breast meat and I ate it and in the morning the boys said it was an act of will not to eat that last piece man <laughs> we wanted to save you one but we had to to work at it all right well thanks for showing up and uh doesn't look like uh there's any more questions and I've uh yammered on here longer than what is advertised or what I usually do but uh, yeah, if you've hung in there, hopefully um, you got something out of this and look forward to seeing you next week. So take care everyone. And uh, yeah, there you go. See you next time.